So the last time I had to speak in front of this many people without PowerPoint slides was my bar mitzvah. <laughs> and if any of you were here for my bar mitzvah, you'd be taking your five minute break right now. <laughs> so it, it started with two small nodules on her back near her shoulder blades. And who knew that there was such a thing as the uh, posterior scapula lymph node chain? And two months later, she had a spleen that occupied the left upper quadrant. She had circulating lymphoma cells. And my wife, Marion, was diagnosed with a mantle cell lymphoma. And over the next 12 months, I can't remember how many times she was in the hospital, but I remember how many times she lost her hair. And that was three. First with the induction chemotherapy, and then when she went for the bone marrow conditioning, and then finally when her lymphoma relapsed, and it all happened within the same calendar year. And with her diagnosis, I became her caregiver, and I took that seriously. I tried to get to pretty much every appointment that she had as much as I could. And she would wake up hours before a, clinician, a physician visit, and she was really hobbled by pain from her lymphoma, and it took her a while to get ready, and it was an enormous, it was enormous effort, and it was hard to watch. And I asked her, why did you put so much effort into this? Why not just sleep in? And you know, if you're a little disheveled, it'll be okay when you get to your doctor. And she said, you don't understand. It's not about vanity. I want my doctor to see me as somebody who's worth saving. I want him to see me as somebody that, that hasn't given up hope. But my wife was a physician. She was a pathologist. And so she welcomed having a clinician as a, as a spouse. And I was helpful there. I recognized the rash of disseminated zoster. And when she had strider, I knew that she had airway involvement. Um, still, I, it didn't make a difference at the end. I, I, it made me feel as good as I've ever felt about being a physician. But I, I still couldn't change the outcome. So her last hospitalization occurred uh, about three years after her initial diagnosis, and she came in with gram-negative sepsis, and she recovered from that, but she started to decline neurologically. And she had a brain MRI that showed that she had lymphomatous meningitis. And she had gone through her treatment options. There was nothing left to do. And uh, when she came delirious, um, she was started on morphine and hospice. And it was that moment that I had the most important conversation and, and piece of advice that I got during her care, and it didn't come from a doctor. It came from a social worker. And so a social worker asked me, what, what do your kids know about this? And I told her I was kind of focused on the medical care as a physician for my wife. And they knew that she was sick and that she was in the hospital and she wasn't doing well. And she looked at me and she said, you have to tell your kids that, that their mother is dying. And you have to tell them now. You don't have any more time. So I have four kids. And two of them were in high school and two were in middle school. And so friends brought three of them the three oldest ones, into the hospital. And we came to a small room, and I sat with the four of them. And I told them that, that mom was not going to survive this, that she was going to die here. And there was disbelief, and there was anger, and there was frustration and, and sadness. And there were tears, and there were hugs, and there was love, and there was understanding. And I thank God every day that my wife had prepped my kids for that day. And, and we all went into the room together to be there as a family except we weren't all there as a family because my youngest one wasn't there. So he was in Connecticut, and he was on a, a, fam a school trip. And we had to get the Connecticut State Troopers to find him. Um, and, and they did. And they put him in the back seat of a cruiser, and they took him to northern New Jersey. And friends picked him up from there. And they, they brought him down to Philadelphia. In five hours, he had no idea why he was coming home. And I get a call from, from my friends uh, that they're, they're at the hospital and they're coming up the elevator. And I said, well, I, I need to meet you at the elevator because you can't bring him here yet. I, I can't, I need to talk to him before he comes into the scene. And I get up to leave the room to talk to him and my daughter, who's 15 years old, comes up and, and walks with me and I ask her, where are you going? And she says, I'm going with you. And I asked her why. And she said, I know what you're gonna tell Raphael. I, I know what you're gonna say in that room. I don't want him to be alone when you say it. I, I wanna be there. And it was my daughter's voice, but it was my wife's words. It was like she was talking to me. And it was like the mantle of, of motherhood had, had passed from my wife to my daughter. And it, it was, I think, the first time that I thought, you know, we can get through this, um, that, that we would be OK. So after my wife died, my colleagues wondered if I was going to come back to work, because I work in a cancer center, and clearly this is close to home. And the truth is, I don't think I'd want to work anywhere else. And I'm a better physician now than I was before my wife's illness. And not because I know cancer any better, but I understand cancer patients better. And I understand their families. And now when a patient comes to see me in clinic, I'll comment on how they look and how together their outfit is. And I'll notice how their hair has grown back in. And I'll ask about their husbands and their wives. And I'll ask how their kids are doing. Medical school teaches us medicine, but life teaches us how to be a doctor. <laughs>